let's talk about the global queues. The screen is looking weak, especially if you see the Asian markets are down quite a bit. Uh, even the U.S. futures are down. Here's Nigel with the world view. Well, the U.S. markets ended sharply lower in Friday's trading session. What spoke them? The cautious forecast by the U.S. Fed, global growth worries, as well as the inverted U.S. yield. That's something, in fact, that played out. And that's why all the three indices, they ended in the red in, uh, in Friday's uh, trading session. A couple of pockets did see selling. Banking stocks, they saw a big, big selling pressure. And yet the FANG stocks as well that were under pressure. That explains why the Nasdaq was a relative underperformer, ending with a cut of close to 2.5% odd. European markets as well ended in the red. They were down between a percent and a half to around 2%. The manufacturing data coming out of there was extremely disappointing. Eurozone PMI, manufacturing PMI data, that came in at its lowest levels we've seen in the last 71 months. Even the German manufacturing data, that in fact did slump to its lowest levels we've seen in the last six years odd. And the yield curve, uh, even the yields, the German uh, uh, bond yields, in fact, out there, that turned negative as well for the first time since 2016. Even uh, the Japanese yield, in fact, this morning has come in sharply lower. But talking about Japan, that market is under some selling pressure. The uh, yen, in fact, has strengthened to its highest levels we've seen in the last six weeks. And that's why the Japanese index, that's a developed market, that's down close to around 650 points. But all the other Asian markets as well are lower. The SGX Nifty is indicating a start closer towards the 11,400-odd mark. Back to you guys. Thank you very much, uh, Nigel, for that wrap. Uh, well, actually, the market is going to talk a lot about the yield inversion in the U.S. markets, which with the three-month yield rising above the 10-year yield. Uh, should we worry about this and in emerging markets? Paul Kitney of Daiwa Capital Markets joins us on the phone line. Good morning, Paul. Thank you very much for joining us. You were one of the first guys who said that you would start buying the Indian market sometime earlier this year, and uh, everyone's followed suit. Uh, now, how serious is this yield curve inversion? Should we see some bit of serious profit taking in Indian markets uh, and emerging markets? Should we see the flow of FIIs reverse? So thank you for uh, for inviting me on your program again this morning. So you see, uh, so you know, our our view has been since November of last year when it was very much non-consensus mm. that the U.S. was heading for a recession in 2020, possibly by the middle of 2020. Now, we've seen then, since then you know, a number of growth indicators, both in the U.S. and in Europe, particularly in developed economies, uh, that are showing a, a sharper slowdown than, than was previously anticipated. So what we're seeing in terms of the inversion of the yield curve is that growth expectations have shifted down. What we're also seeing is globally uh, a pattern of disinflation. So this is synchronized disinflation. Now, that doesn't mean falling inflation, uh, ne negative inflation uh, rates, but falling rates of inflation globally. Now, this is, as we had severe previously discussed on former programs, negative overall for countries such as Japan, who are starting off from a you know, near deflationary starting point, and also in Europe. So this is particularly bad for, for developed markets. In contrast, some emerging markets, which are starting off from relatively high levels of inflation, disinflation gives room for central banks to reverse former tight monetary policy and to start easing. Now, we were the first to make the call uh, late last year that India would be the first central bank to cut rates in 2019. That's turned out to be the case. We'll see further rate cuts there as well. Now, growth rates in India and also ASEAN are significantly higher than they are elsewhere, uh, than in uh, most of the emerging market space. And we see risks actually in those countries that are much more geared into the global trade cycle, such as Japan, Korea, and also, and also um, uh, Taiwan. But the nice thing about Indian growth is that its growth is much less correlated with the global trade cycle, and so it remains an overweight. Now, to your point, how does India fare with all of this? Well, it's unlikely to fully decouple, that is, DM's not going to go down and India um, go up at the same time, at least not for any sort of particular point in time. But we do see India outperforming. 
<laughs> okay, so India is going to outperform. Paul, hi, good morning. Uh, but it's interesting, despite growth and trade concerns, developed markets like the US have, have performed quite well this year. I mean, the S&P 500 is up 11% this year. Uh, do you think that performance could continue or outperformance vis-a-vis -vis other markets? I think developed markets are under risk particularly now as we're getting closer to the point where we will see a, a sharper downturn in the U.S. economy. So our scenario from last November was that we would – so our scenario, just to, to make it very clear here, was from our outlook report for 2019 last November, was we expected to see a year-end rally into the first quarter or two of 2019, given the fact that we still have moderate growth in 2019, but an easier stance on the part of the Fed. So easier credit conditions with still a moderate step down in growth should be constructive for equities in the first quarter, well, from starting from year end, at least into the first quarter and possibly into the second quarter of this year. So that has been our scenario. However, our view has been that given our scenario in 2020, where we see a sharp downturn from around the middle of 2020, now perhaps that's coming forward a bit, uh, is that equity markets discount around one year ahead. So if we think the sharp downturn, once the tax cut effect drops out, is around the middle of 2020, then we need to be out of equities as an asset class at or before the middle of this year, which is about 12 months and 12 months ahead. So our view has is, 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 is been is, is that there's, there, there's sort of a, a, a roadmap there that sort of provided a case for an, a near-term uh, rally where EM will do rel relatively well, but uh, in that context, we see you know the, the prospects of there being you know you know quite a severe bear market uh, from at at the latest the middle of this year, but possibly earlier, uh, led by developed markets on the downside. We see emerging markets outperforming, particularly. ASEAN and India, uh, given their low exposure to the global trade cycle. Okay, just a final question for the near term. We've seen a significant flow of foreign funds into India in the month of March, about three billion dollars actually to date, month to date. Uh, will that continue? I, th I think it will. It's, it's been a lot, and we made that call as well, actually, late last year, because we saw that the fall in oil prices from 75 to 50. Now, to be sure, they've bounced. Uh, was going to improve the currency fundamentals in India and Indonesia and in the Philippines, by the way, twin, twin deficit, large oil importing uh, countries, improving the current account balance. Now, that has improved the currency fundamentals. What it also means is, is that for global yield investors, so, this is not, so there's obviously two types of flows. You've got capital flows coming through from foreign direct investment, so, you know, high returns on capital in India are attractive from that perspective. But there's also portfolio flows. And so in a disinflationary environment, when long bond yields are 7 7.5%, seven uh, that is attractive, particularly for foreign investors searching for uh, you know, sust sustainable, for sust sustainable yields, and that itself can improve the overall balance of payments, and uh, I think it's actually likely to be sustainable. Whether we see the same degree of inflow from here, um, that's, that's more of a tricky question, but I don't see the rupee weakening sharply from here at all. Oh. Paul, uh, thank you for your insights and for joining us on the show today. That's the word coming in from Daiwa Capital Markets. They believe that emerging markets will outperform developed markets because of a lesser correlation to the slowing growth trajectory. But uh, on to a quick programming reminder for today. CNBC TV 18 launches a special initiative in partnership with the National Stock Exchange. On the 25th of every month, we tell you how investing in the stock market or equities makes one financially disciplined. This is a monthly program to inform and educate investors about smart investing and enabling the journey to wealth creation. Do catch our special coverage all through the day only on CNBC TV 18.